in the Christian scripture where um, uh, Yahweh, God of Christian scripture, expressed that he doesn't love sinners. Well, there are, there are statements that talk about yeah. God hating certain people. Yeah. For example, Psalm 5 uh, says that. Uh, Romans 9 says, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. So the thing, we one of the things we do if we're going to look at the whole Bible and what it says on a topic, which I'd love to do at some point, uh, but if we're going to look at something like the love of God, is we have uh, we have to be systematic, meaning God doesn't tell us everything about a topic in one spot. It's found throughout Scripture, and when you want to uh, know what the top, what something is according to the Bible, you have to gather up all those statements and then systematize them. Right. So, for example, um, uh, think of this. If I, it, it, in Ephesians 5, it says that a husband is to love his wife. Right. Now, the, the implication, if you're reading that accurately, is that Paul is saying that a husband's to love his wife, not other women. Right. He's not supposed to love other women. Right. Um, that doesn't mean absolutely like he's to have no love for other women. It's saying that he's to have a special love for his wife that doesn't belong to other women. Right. He's to love her, lay down his life for her and, uh, you know, uh, nourish her and, 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 and feed her and so forth. Um, there's a similar idea when you see Jesus saying, unless you hate father or mother, uh, you know, uh, then you're not worthy of me. And in context, what Jesus is talking about is people who are unwilling to confess him and follow him because their parents and others don't, because they would put their parents and, and siblings at odds with them. And Jesus is saying that they owe their love and loyalty ultimately to him over and above others. It doesn't mean that they're supposed to be bad to them, that they're not supposed to have a familial love for them, Right. It means that they're not supposed to have that absolute love that belongs to God alone. Now, even Muslims should be able to recognize that God deserves our ultimate love. We are to love him above all else, which means that we're going to serve him even if it might displease somebody else. Right now, we don't believe that's really unloving to those people, but it certainly does contrast with our love for God. And so comparatively speaking, when we do things like that, we are loving him and hating them, right? We are, we are choosing God above them. Now, I would say that when you look at the love of God in Scripture, that you have to make these sorts of distinctions as well. God has a general love for, for people as his creatures, right? Scripture says that God causes it to rain and the sun to shine on the just and the unjust, and that's in a context where Jesus is talking about God's goodness to all of creation, right? But that uh, isn't the same thing as saying that everyone experiences God's saving love. God's saving love is particular to those who will believe in him, right? He's not just going to save sinners who don't have their sins atoned for because God is just. But he's provided atonement. And so if anybody doesn't go to Jesus, the fault lies with them. It's not because God has not been loving and made provision uh, you know, for uh, and promised to save anyone who comes to him. Right? We believe that God promises to save anyone who comes to him. Whoever does not come to him, they're excluding themselves. Right now, I mean, we could talk about uh, other issues that Christians sometimes discuss, like predestination and foreknowledge and all those sorts of things. But the point I'm making here is simply that God, in his common grace, does good to all people, thus showing his love towards them, and the gospel is proclaimed to all people, and all people are called to faith. And so, uh, you know, in, in that sense, we can say that whoever does not repent and believe does not experience God's saving love, but will be the objects of his wrath. Right, but that wrath comes after God is long suffering and patient and so forth. And we should rejoice in this, by the way, because you know, what is the natural cry of the human heart when they're subjects of brutality and terrorism like Muslims commit? Uh, when they, you know, one of the things that has uh, that uh, also I mentioned before, one of the things that impelled me to want to talk about, I want to talk to Muslims was that Muslim saying, 
he wanted Allah to love him. And I felt so pitiful, you know, it seemed so pitiful to me. But another thing that really got me was when I was studying, uh, I don't know if you know that the word um, assassin actually comes from an Arabic word. So does the word for hashish. In fact, the word assassin and hashish are derived from the same uh, uh, background in Islamic history. In, in, at one point in Islamic history, certain leaders would send out uh, certain fighters who would get high on hashish. They were known as the hashashayim. And they would get high on hashish in order to go and kill people for their Muslim leaders. And included in these acts of assassination, that's where you get assassin, hashish, hashashayim. They were high on hashish. Not only would they assassinate people, but they would steal the children of believers, take them back to Muslims, and then raise them as Muslims, train them to be warriors, to go back and fight against their parents later in time. That, to me, was just the most gruesome evil I can possibly imagine. Taking people's children, indoctrinating them into Islam, and then training them to go back and fight against their own family. Right? Imagine how that would demoralize the people who have to defend themselves. How can they fight against their own children? Right? And how could they endure the, the, the fact that their, their own children have been turned to a false religion? Well, this is just the sort of thing that the psalmists are expressing when they cry out to God to either convert such people or defend them. Lord, bring justice to this situation. Deal with these people who are doing this stuff to your church and to your people. That's where you get the souls underneath the altar who had been beheaded for the sake of Jesus in Revelation 5 saying, O Lord, holy and true, how long until you avenge our blood? They're crying out for God, God to exact uh, uh, judgment upon people who persist in evil and wickedness and unbelief. You know, if, if God doesn't judge wickedness and evil, then then this is what we're going to deal with for eternity, right? Or this is what the world's going to be like for eternity. It's going to be wicked men doing wicked things and the righteous always being afflicted. Uh, there's, there's no good news in the idea that God won't ultimately be just. Um, and so Christians don't shy away from the fact that there is a sense in which even those who are made in his image and thus objects of his care in that respect are also the objects of his anger and will be judged and destroyed by him. We believe that. That's why we proclaim the gospel and tell people they need to repent and be saved. Because unless they do, God's patience will come to an end, and uh, they are cutting themselves off from God's saving love. So that, that's how I would answer that. Thank you for that. Um, just a side note that um, I'm from Turkey, and in the history of Ottoman Empire, that's what Ottomans did the same. T they took the children of Christians and then they trained them as a Muslim and then they sent them back to kill their family. And sadly, at school, this is, we learn um, something. Um, Turkish people are very proud of it. Uh, mm. That's what we've done, sadly. Yeah, I think the book that I read a long time ago was by Bernard Lewis called The Assassins, if anybody's interested. Okay.